as I listen to that song, it always reminds me of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid, though the earth tremble and the mountains topple into the depths of the sea. No matter what happens, no matter what happens in your life, God will get you through. No matter what happens in your life, God is a friend who is always found in times of trouble. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. We are in a series called The Main Thing, keeping the main thing the main thing. And that's, that's God's love for us. That's our love for God and our love for others. And we talked about how do we keep the main thing the main thing when we have people who are different than us, when we have people who, are, who dis disagree with us, and today it's people who dislike us or our enemies, right, our detractors. And as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of uh, a pillow that my grandma had, and sewn into that pillow was an Irish prayer. And this prayer stuck with me, and, and I think it's a good example for today. It said, may those that love us, love us. And those that don't love us, may God turn their hearts. And if he doesn't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles so that we may know them by their limp. <laughs> God does not often turn people's ankles who are our enemies so that we know them by, our, by their limp. We know our enemies in other ways. By the hurt that they've given us, by the scars they've left, by the uh, painful things they have done. And so they may not limp, we know them. And that's a, that is a good Irish prayer, isn't it? And so as we think about the enemies that we have in our life today, how do we engage with them? How do we interact with them? Well, Jesus gives us a good example, a good teaching on this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. You remember in January and February, we did a series called Upside Down Life, Upside Down Living that went through the Sermon on the Mount. And, and we talked about how God took, or Jesus in this sermon took, took life as we know and as we expected it, it to be and turned it on its head. And when he turned it on its head, it became more righteous. It became more in the line with what God wants. And he does that with, oh, with our passage here. And what he did was he would, he would state a law from the Old Testament and then he'd explain it. And he'd explain it according to how God meant it, not how the people were understanding it. And he did that for five or six. And then we come to our passage today and he does that again with the, with the law of love, the main thing. He says, verse 43, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. At the beginning of this passage, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now in my Bible, when it quotes an Old Testament passage in the New Testament, it puts it in bold. And in my Bible, it says, love your neighbor. That's all in bold. But then when he says, and hate your enemy, it's not in bold. Why? Well, love your neighbor comes from Leviticus chapter 19. It's when Moses is giving the law of the community of how do the Israelites interact with each other and how, how do they interact with their surrounding nations. And in Leviticus 19, Jesus said, or God says that they are to love their neighbor, not harboring any hatred or bitterness towards their brother or sister. Now that passage was focused directly on Israelites. It was focused directly on how do you love your Israelite brothers and sisters? Well, what happened as time went on, the teachers of the law took that phrase and they hijacked it. They twisted it. And what happened was they began to say, 
love your neighbor, meaning your Jewish brother or sister, your fellow Israelite, that's who you are to love, but you are not commanded on what to do with a non-Jewish person. And since we're not commanded on what to do with a non-Jewish person, you therefore have the right to hate them, to hate your enemy, to hate the Gentiles. Now, like I said, it's a twisted form of it because these teachers of the law didn't go to the end of Leviticus 19 where God says, and the foreigner that comes into your presence, love them as you love yourself. So when they hijacked it, they left out a portion of the law. And you think about how ironic that is, how some of these teachers who were supposed to teach and know the law better than anybody else, they taught it and they left portions of it out. And Jesus is correcting that. He's saying, no, they put restrictions on love. The restrictions that, they, that the religious leaders had put on love was to love your neighbor and to hate your enemy. But Jesus is saying, that's not the way. In verse 44, he goes on, he says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus is re-clarifying for the, the, the Jews that the law of love was not just for fellow Jews, but it was for everyone. He's removing the restrictions that are on love. Jesus is removing the restrictions that the teachers of the law had put on it. And when he removes it, he says, not only are you to love them, but you're to pray for them. And that phrase, and pray for those, actually means, and to pray on behalf or stand in the gap for, to come next to and stand with someone. So you are to stand with your enemy and pray for them. You're to love them and to stand with them and pray for them. He's removing restrictions. And when he removes restrictions, what he's doing is he's removing all categories we have for human beings, right? There's a category for friends and there's a category for enemies. He's removing both cat. He's removing all the categories and he's making one. He's saying, look, we have one category and that category is full of people we should love. It is our neighbor. Our neighbor is the one we should love. And even our enemies are included in that. So I go to the baseball field yesterday. I got two sons playing. And of course the games um, overlap. So I'm there for like six hours. Um, and I've been, my sons have played baseball long enough that I, I recognize or know most of the parents. I recognize or know most of the kids, right? Either they played with my son last year, or the year before, or something like that. And I also have opinions on the kids and their parents. And, you know, those opinions are, another word for that, are categories. And, and if, sure enough, something happened yesterday, not including me, not involving me, but people were yelling at each other, and I thought to myself, that's why I don't like that dad. And then I go home, and I open up my binder that has all my notes for Sunday morning, and I start reading through Matthew chapter 5. And I have to close the binder, and I have to say, Lord, i got to start over, don't I? Please forgive me for the thought I had towards that. That man has no clue what I thought. I didn't say anything, but those are not the thoughts that we're talking about here. How easily categories are created in our lives. These people are this, these people are this, and these people are this. And what Jesus is doing, he's saying, look, get rid of all those categories. You have one category. And that category is your neighbor and you're to love them. And Jesus, he, goes, he goes even more to explain this in Luke chapter 10 when he talks about the Good Samaritan. Do you remember that parable? A man, a Jewish man, is walking down the road. And robbers come, they jump him, they beat him, they strip him, and they leave him there laying on the side of the road, naked and half dead. And then along comes a priest, a Jewish priest, a pastor. And he sees the man lying on the side of the road, half dead, and he crosses to the other side and he keeps going. And then along comes a Levite, a good church-attending Christian. And the Levite comes along, sees the man half dead on the side of the road, crosses the other side and passes him. And then along comes a Samaritan. And to put this in, to put this in, in, in modern-day categories, to put this in modern-day language, along comes a Palestinian and sees a Jewish man laying on the side of the road, naked and half dead. And the Palestinian lifts him up on his donkey. 
and heals and binds the, the Jewish man's wounds. And then on, the, on his donkey, he leads the Jewish man into the town. He rents a hotel room. He pays for everything that needs to be done to take care of this man. And then he looks at the innkeeper and he says, look, whatever expense you incur from taking care of this man, I'll pay you when I get back. So he's not only done what needs to be taken care of now, but he's taking care of it into the future. And at the end of the parable, Jesus says, who was this man's neighbor? And they said, the one who loved him. He goes, go and do likewise. We have one category. And that category is our neighbor. That category is the people that we are to love. We can't have multiple categories in this life. We can't put restrictions on our love. Jesus saw the restrictions that the, 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 the teachers of the law put on it, on the law, and then he removed them. And then he goes on to explain a little bit more about God. He says, verse 45, so that we are to love our, our neighbor as our, or are we to love our enemy and pray for them, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Now, the, the, the phrase actually says children of your father in heaven, but the force behind it is translated well in the net version of the Bible where it says, so that you may be like your father in heaven. When you love your enemy, you are like your father in heaven. It's similar to when I go home to Marshall County, Indiana, and I start seeing people who knew my dad and they start talking to me or they see me preach or they see me teach and they'll, they'll come up to me and it's not unusual for somebody to come up and say, you, you remind me so much of your dad. Your hand motions, your cadence of your verb, your voice, your, the, the, the sound of your voice, the, the words you choose, the phrases you choose, how your hands move around, you remind me of your dad. So when I preach, I preach like my earthly father. I preach as he spoke because I learned it from him. When we love, we are acting like our heavenly father because we first received the love we have from him. And Jesus is saying, look, they put restrictions on love. I'm removing all restrictions on it. And when you love, that's when you're acting like God. That's when you're behaving with the character of God. And he goes on, he says, for God, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God has no category for love. Every human being is underneath his love. And notice it says, for he causes his son to rise, S-U-N. Isn't that interesting? God, it's God's son because he created it. He created everything, and yet it's God that provides for what we need. How? Well, okay, think of it this way. You all, I'm sure, are very strict on your diet, eating all the right portions of everything, and it being all the right portions of food and vegetables and fruit. I'm sure you all do that perfectly, because um, uh, I, I don't. Um, but we, we have a way of eating that has to happen for us to be healthy. So what do we do? We go to Kroger. We go to Kroger and we get fruits, we get vegetables, we get meat, right? You get some other things, it's on your time, whatever. But we have, you need those things to survive. But that food wasn't grown in Kroger. And I know I'm not giving you some revelation, right? That food came from somewhere else. And if you follow the production line, eventually it came from a seed going in the ground, water being poured on the seed, and the sun shining. And that seed sprouts and it grows all sorts of fruits and vegetables that make it to Kroger that you and I then eat. But here's the thing. Christians are not the only people that shop in Kroger. They'll take anybody's money. Everybody, Christian or non-Christian, shops for food. Maybe not in Kroger, but they go someplace to a grocery store. Because God provides what we need to eat and survive, no matter if you're Christian or not. No matter if you're good or evil. Righteous or unrighteous. God has no restrictions on his love. And so when we love, that's when we behave like God because he has no restrictions on it. But, but there are times where we don't love with God's love. In verse 46 and 47, 
It says, first, you love those who love you. What reward will you have? And he asks this question about, he asks it twice. He says, look, if you love those who love you, you're acting like the tax collectors and the Gentiles, the tax collectors being the morally bankrupt ones. So you think about people in our society that are morally bankrupt, that's the tax collector. All right, and, and then the Gentile is the unbeliever, the one who does not believe in God. And he's saying, look, if you love those who love you back, you're, no, you're, you're not loving with anything different than the morally bankrupt and the unbeliever. So even in here, when we're nice to each other and with my family, that's no different. Everybody does that. Everybody does that. It's not unusual. It's a natural love that we all have. And he says at the end of verse 47, he goes, but when you do this, what are you doing out of the ordinary? What are you doing out of the ordinary? Because when we love with ordinary love, that love is coming from our fleshly nature and everybody does that. But we are not called to ordinary love. We are called to love like God loves. God's love is anything but ordinary. It's extra. It's over the top. It's unusual love that he has for every single person. And that's the type of love that we should have. In verse 48, it goes on to say, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's not talking about, remember, the, the concept here, the subject here is love. It's not necessarily talking about live a perfect life. What he's saying is like, when you, when, when you love with perfect love, you're loving like God's perfect love. And that should be our goal, to love with God's perfect love. To have one category and everybody in it. And then when everybody's in it, we love them all with perfect love. The love that comes from God and God alone. We cannot love people by ourselves. We need God's love. And when we love with God's love, the goal is to love with his perfect love. So I think the main point of, of what I'm trying to say up here is Jesus has removed all restrictions, right? God's love has no restrictions, therefore neither should ours. God's love should, has no restrictions, therefore neither should ours. Our love should not have any restrictions. We should have one category, everybody in it's our neighbor and we should love them. So if you're like me at the baseball field and you got categories of people, we need to do away with those. And we are to love people. You say, Matt, that's not easy. You're exactly right. That's why you can't do it by yourself. That's why you can't do it with your own love. That's why you need God's love because only God's love gives us the, the ability to love our enemy. Because if you love your enemy, it's like if I were to tell you to go pet a pit bull with a dead animal in its mouth. You don't do that, why? Because that pit bull is gonna be pretty defensive and more than likely it's gonna bite you. And you said, and you're kind of saying, Matt, that's what it sounds like you're asking me to do. And it's like, that's exactly right. When you love your enemy, you're going to get bit. It's going to happen. But there's no wiggle room here. Not because Matt says so, because the Bible literally says, love your enemy and those persecuting you. In Luke's version in chapter 6, it says, love those who hate you. These are the categories, right? Everybody is in the category of neighbor. Those who hate you, those who persecute you, and those who love you and are kind to you. It's all there, and you got to love them with God's love. And when you love your enemy, it is not easy, and you might get bit. But what is love? It's doing what is good for someone, even if it costs you something. And what I found when I love an enemy, often it doesn't make everything turn out all right. Often it doesn't make them be kind to me. But you know what it does to me? It draws me closer to Jesus because that's what Jesus did. Right? Think about that. If we want an example of this, we have to go no farther than the cross. Jesus, Jesus came to this earth. He lived a perfect life and he was crucified. Why? Because people hated him. They didn't like him, therefore they crucified him. They hated him. And when they hated him, they crucified him and they ridiculed him. If you're the Messiah, you come down off that cross. If you're the Savior, you show us. You can heal other people here yourself. They said, we don't believe in you. We think you're worthless. We think you're, you're, you're nothing. And what did Jesus do? 
but he stayed on the cross. He stayed on the cross. Why? Because he knew his sacrifice would save the people shouting at him. In fact, the Roman soldiers, after Jesus died, he says, surely this man was the son of God. I don't know if that was a salvation experience, but it was definitely the soldier changing of heart as he watched Jesus be crucified. Jesus loved our enemy and so should we. Jesus didn't have restrictions on his love and neither should we. So how do we do this? How do we love our enemy? There's three things that I think are very practical. One, one is you, you do acts of love towards them, right? Love is doing what is good for someone even if it costs you. Do acts of love. Luke 6 uh, is where it's, it's Luke's version of this passage. And in verse 27, he says, look, he says, love those who hate you and do what's good for those who hate you. So do good acts. Romans chapter 12 talks about giving your enemy a cup of water and giving your enemy food. Maybe this week you've got an enemy and you buy them a cup of coffee from Starbucks. Maybe you buy them lunch this week. Or at least you offer. Hey, I'm going over here. Do you want me to get you some lunch? Hey, I'm going to Starbucks. Do you want me to get you a cup of coffee? It's a good act you can do for someone. They're going to sit there and go, why are they doing that? You know, it's interesting. I heard Chip Ingram tell a story one time where there was a, he had a teammate on his basketball team that absolutely hated him, would just ridicule him at every chance he got. And it even was intimidating. This guy was, was a, a bully. He was big. He was mean. He, he got, often got into fights, and, and he, would, he would just bully Chip. And Chip, finally, he, what he started to do was he said, well, I couldn't t- take him on one-on-one. And so I began to do stuff on the basketball court that made him look foolish. I'd throw the ball maybe a little bit harder, or I'd throw it just out of his reach so it looked like it was his fault. But Chip realized that's not going to change the relationship. So you know what he did? He started to serve the man. And he, in the locker room, he, he, they'd all be leaving. He's like, hey, you want me to carry your bag? The guy'd be like, oh, I forgot my shoes. Chip would be like, I'll run back and get them for you. The guy'd be like, oh, where's my jersey? Here, Chip's like, hey, I, I went and got it for you. Here you go. And it got to the point where this man began to mock this guy more, Chip, more. Why? Because you look at my personal servant. Look at what this guy does for me. He does my every bitty. The guy thought he won. But you know what Chip was doing? He was actually loving him with the love of Christ. And he was willing to humble himself to an enemy and do that. He goes, you know, I never saw that man come to know Jesus, but he did become kinder eventually. He did realize eventually what was going on, that Chip wasn't his personal servant, but he was somebody who cared enough to help take care of him. That's what we've got to do. We've got to do acts of love. The second thing we do is we have to speak words of love. Luke chapter 6 goes on to say we need to bless and not curse. How easy it is when somebody at work is frustrating you or somebody around the neighborhood, somebody that you don't like. You get some with some other people that don't like them. 15, 20, 30, 40 minutes will go by and you realize all you've done is mock that person. That's not what you need to do. You need to speak blessing over that person, not curse. So we, we act with acts of love, we speak words of love, and then what we see in this passage is we pray for them. We pray for those who persecute us. And like I said, what that means is, in this phrase, you come alongside your enemy and you, you intercede for them on behalf of them with God. Instead of saying, Lord, help that enemy over there whom I don't like, but I know I need to love. Lord, you go over there and help. No, you literally... Spiritually come beside that person. You say, God, I know this person's me. I know this person uh, doesn't like you. And God, I want to pray a blessing over them. God, don't send them to hell. God, do something that would cause them to come to know you. You start praying blessings over that person. You put your arm around them and you help them. The best example we have in the Bible of this is Moses. At one point, God was going to destroy the people of Israel because they were worshiping a God. That was not him, a false God. But Moses stepped in and said, no, God, don't destroy them. If I found favor, if I found favor in your, in your eyes, don't destroy them. And it says that God relented and he didn't destroy them because Moses came beside them. And that's what we need to do with our enemies. We gotta come beside them and pray for them. And again, we have an example of Jesus in this because when he hung on that cross, what did he do? 
as people ridiculed and mocked him, you know what he did? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As people were mocking him and hating him and spitting on him and throwing things at him, as they watched him being crucified, Jesus had the audacious love to be able to look down and say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They don't know that I hang on this cross for them, for you, and for me. They don't know. So we love our enemies with actions of love, with words of love, and we pray for them. And the and a final note on prayer, when you pray for somebody, it humanizes them. It humanizes them and makes you look at them like a human because you begin to see in their life the cracks. You know what? I could see why maybe they're a little bit mean here because, man, they have a, a rough home life or this happened in their past or the boss tends to come down on them in these situations. Then you begin to humanize them. You can see who they are. And then you begin to form love for them. I love this quote from John Stott. John Stott was a, a British preacher. It says, It is impossible to pray for somebody without loving them and impossible to go on praying without discovering that our love grows and matures. Because when you pray for somebody and you humanize them, your love grows and matures for them because you're seeing them for who they are, not, who you, not for the category you had them in. So we love our enemies with action, with words, and with prayer. And that's something we can do every day. That's something we can do every day. And we do it because that's what Jesus did. So to keep the main thing, the main thing, when we come into contact with enemies, you have to love them. You have to love them. And you love them with the love that Christ has given us without restriction as your neighbor. Let me pray. Lord, I lift up everybody in here. Lord, I don't know what form an enemy has taken in a person or a group or an entity, but Lord, I know they all have them. I have them. People coming either at us individually or at the church, Lord, just with society changing and coming at the church and, and trying to try to separate us. Lord, we know that there will always be enemies, but Father, show us how to love them. Show us how to give them a kind word this week. Show us how to give a kind um, action this week. Show us how to pray for them, that we may love them, Jesus, as you loved us. For once we were far off, once we were enemies, but Jesus, you came to demonstrate God's love and to draw us in as a friend. And so, Father, today I pray that you would bring enemies to mind and show us how to love them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.